Hi everyone, welcome to Math 100. Today I will be reviewing the practice final exam, problems 1 through 7. It will cover units 8A to 12D. So we'll start with number 1, which states to determine whether the growth or decay is linear or exponential and answer the associated question. So problem 1, the value of your house is rising by 60% per year. If it is worth $200,677 today, what will it be worth in three years? So because the quantity, the value of the house, increases per year by the same percentage of 16%, we know that this is not linear and it is exponential. This type of growth is exponential growth. For reference, you can refer to Unit 8A, page 474, the examples 1E and 1B. 1E is an example problem for exponential decay and 1B is an example problem for exponential growth. So back to this problem, we are going to want to calculate the exponential growth for each, for the three years. So for the first year, we multiply the 16% increase. So as a decimal, that's 0 0.16 times the initial amount of the house at 200 1,677 and we get an increase of $32,108.32. So this is our increase for one year, but in order to know the final amount after the first year, we have to add this increase to the initial amount of the home valued at $200,677. And from here, so just for reference again, this is the increase and this is the initial amount. We get or $232,785.32. So that is the value of the home after one year. But again, this question asks us to identify the value of the home after three years. So we have to keep calculating the value of the home. So by the second year, we're going to do the same thing again. So by the second year, with a 16% increase, and remember we take the value after the first year of the home, so that's valued at 232700 $85.32. The increase of the home is $37,245.65. And we add that to the value of the home after the first year. So that's $232,785.32. And you get a value of $270,030.97. And that's the value of the home after the second year. And then we calculate the value of the home after the third year. So again, the home value increases by 16%. And you multiply this by the value of the home after the second year at $270,030.97, an increase of $43,204.96, and we add that to the value of the home after the second year at $270,030.97. The value of the home after the third year is 
$3.93. So again, we were told to determine whether the growth or decay is linear or exponential and answer the associated question, right? So we know that this is exponential growth and we know that the value of the home after the third year is the following. For problem number two, we're told to provide an appropriate response. So the half-life of a drug in the bloodstream is 10 hours. By what factor does the concentration of the drug decrease in 15 hours? So with this problem, it is important to note that we are find, finding a factor of the concentration of the drug for the half-life. So if you recall, on page 485, there is a formula that you can use to solve this. And remember, the half-life is the value of the quantity repeatedly decreasing to half its value, with each halving occurring in a time. So the formula from page 485 is new value is equal to initial value times one half to the power of t over time for the half-life. So we know that the time and we know the time for the half-life. So from the problem, the time for the half-life, so it says the half-life of a drug in the bloodstream is 10 hours. So the time for the half-life is 10 hours. The time, the other time that we have, so it says by what factor does the concentration of the drug decrease in 15 hours? So that is our other associated time at 15 hours. And then from the original equation, so we don't have to keep rewriting new value and initial value, for the new value, I am going to reassign it to be, to be Q. For the initial value, I will reassign it to be Q naught. Um, that's just so that we can shorten the problem. So um, this aside, the new problem will be written as follows. So we have Q equals Q naught times one half over T, T half. So from here, since we don't have the new value or initial value, we know that we're trying to solve for the concentration, so or the factor. So we're going to divide by Q naught on both sides. So now we have Q over Q naught equals, and remember these canceled, one half. So T we identified was 15. The time for the half-life is 10 hours. And so from here, we can plug this directly into our calculator, and we will get a factor of 0 0.35. So that's our solution for problem number two. So for problem three, we are changing routes a little bit. So the initial population of a town is 17,118, and it grows with a doubling time of 24 years what will the population be in three years? So for this problem, we are dealing with doubling time. So it is different from half-life just because the number is growing, not decreasing or decaying. So this is taken from Unit 8B. You can refer to page 482. A very similar problem is example number two. And on page 482, you can find the formula for this particular problem.
So the formula that you will use is as follows. So we have new value is equal to initial value multiplied by 2 to the power of t over doubling time. And we have the initial population at 17,118. So that's your initial value. You'll multiply that by 2. And we have the time frame that we want. So we're asked what will the population be in three years. Three is your little t. And the doubling time, we're told, is 24 years. So 2 to the power of 3 over 24. So again, you'll plug this into your calculator, and you will get a population of 18,667. And that is your final answer for problem number 3. So next we have problem four. We're told to use the 1960s peak annual growth rate of 2.3% and population of 2 million to predict the current growth rate, GISTIC model. So we're going to assume a current country population of 10 million, and we assume the carrying capacity is 23 million. So we want to find the current growth rate of a population using a logistic model, meaning that we want to use the formula for logistic growth rate. So I've written it here. This is found on page 495, unit 8C, and this is similar to example number three. So formula is as follows. We have logistic growth rate is equal to R times, in parentheses, one minus the population over the carrying capacity. So just for reference, logistic growth rate is going to refer to the population growth rate decreasing as the population approaches the carrying capacity. So with that being said, we are going to plug in what we know for this problem. So we are told that there is an annual growth rate of 2.3%. So that is our logistic growth rate at 2.3%, which is equivalent to our we don't know R, that's multiplied by 1 minus. So the population size during the 1960s is at 2 million. And I will continue to use the units. And the carrying capacity, we're told, is 23 million. And from here, we see that the units for a million will cancel out, and we can continue to isolate R, our unknown variable, by dividing on both sides by 1 minus 2 over 23. And from here, on the right-hand side, 1 minus 2 over 23 will cancel out on numerator and denominator. And we are left with R is equal to 2.3% over 1 minus 2 over 23. You'll plug that into your calculator and find that you get 2.5190%. And because we're not done here, I'm not going to do any preliminary rounding. Um, I'll leave the solution as is. So. We want to find the current growth rate. So for the current growth rate, we'll use the same formula for logistic growth rate. But we don't know the current growth rate. We want to substitute what we do know. So we have R times 1 minus. So our population at the current growth rate is noted as a current country population of 10 million. So we have 1 minus 10 over a carrying capacity of 23 million. And R in this situation is what we solved from the logistic growth rate formula. So 
R is 2.5190% times 1 minus 10 over 23. Okay, and when you plug that into your calculator, you will get 1.42, and don't forget the units, so it's 1.42%. So that is the current growth rate for problem four. So next we will solve for the following. So we have use the earthquake magnitude scale to answer the question. Number five asks how much energy in joules is released by an earthquake of magnitude 7.0. So there are two formulas that you can use. Both are found on page 503, or this is taken from unit 8D, similar to example number one. Formulas are as follows. It doesn't matter which formula you use, but I'm going to go ahead and use this formula here on the left-hand side. So we're solving for E. I will carry down log of E is equal to 4.4 plus 1.5. M is our magnitude at 7.0. And from here, we can plug that into the calculator. So on the right-hand side, we will get 14.9. And to solve from here, mole multiply by 10, so it's 10 to the power of log 10e, right, on the left-hand side. So this will cancel out, and we'll be left with e on the left-hand side, and we have 10 to the power of 14.9. So from here, you would plug that into your calculator, and you will get energy at 7.9 times 10 to the 14th joule. And I rounded to the nearest tenth. All right, and that's how you solve problem five. So problem six is similar in the sense that we are still discussing earthquake magnitudes. Here we are asked how many times as much energy is released by an earthquake of magnitude eight as by one of magnitude six. So again, we're going to use the same formulas from page 503 from problem five. So we are going to calculate the energy for each of these earthquakes, and then we will compare. So for the earthquake with a magnitude of eight, and this time, let's try using the other formula, which is E equals 2.5 times 10 to the fourth times 10 to the power of 1.5 times M. And here, we're going to solve for the energy of earthquake of a magnitude of 8. So we have 2.5 times 10 to the fourth times 10 to the 1.5 times 8. You will get an energy of approximately 2.5 times 10 to the 16th joule. So that's the energy of the earthquake at a magnitude of 8. So if we solve for the energy of the earthquake at a magnitude of 6, we'll get the following. So I'm just rewriting the formula. And here our magnitude is 6. Right? So our energy is approximately 2.5 times 10 to the 13th joule. Uh, we just solved for the energy. The earthquake with magnitude of 8 was 2 magnitude greater than the earthquake with magnitude of 6. And we know this because we can subtract magnitudes from each other. We can take the difference of magnitudes. 
which is 2. So the earthquake with the magnitude of 8 was 2 magnitude greater than the earthquake with magnitude of 6. So that's part of it. And then we also know that it released 10 to the power of 1.5 times 2. So right here, we have the energy, but we're calculating it at 2 magnitude greater. So we have 10 to the power of 1.5 times a magnitude of 2. And here, we can simplify that, and we get 10 to the power of 3. So 10 to the third power times as much energy. And so from here, we have to see if we answered the question. So you go back to the original problem, which asks how many times as much energy is released by an earthquake of magnitude 8 as by 1 of magnitude 6. So we have answered that question. So it's 10 to the third times as much energy. All right, and you are done with problem 6. So we are going to conclude with problem number 7. This problem is taken unit 9. You can review the following definitions, but let's see what we have here. So provide an appropriate response. Number 7 states the following graph represents a function. We need to identify and independent variables as well as the domain and range. First, let's look at the x and y axes. So the x-axis has year, so we have 1980 to 2004. Um, along the y-axis, we have the average age of death with the following ages here. And we have a graph noted here. So we are asked to find the independent variable, which is time. And this is in years. And this is our independent variable because the time varies independently of age. Next, we are going to determine the dependent variable, which is age. And it's age because the age depends on the year. Hence, it is a dependent variable. Now, for domain and range, the domain corresponds to the independent variable, right? So here, the domain is going to be the years between 1980 to 2004. Again, the domain corresponds to the independent variable. And the range corresponds to the, de to the dependent variable. So it's going to be the ages between, and this is just an approximation, but it's the ages between the plotted numbers of the graph. So we've determined that the range is the, the ages between 62 to 79. And like the range, the domain is going to be the years between corresponding to the independent variable. So that's why it's 1980 to 2004, because the graph falls between that domain.